Okay, thank you for, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, or good morning to those in, uh, in the US and elsewhere. Uh, my name is Emil Hkayim. I'm the Senior Fellow for Middle East Security at the ISS, um, where I uh, cover a variety of uh, crises and conflicts. Uh, I never expected to be covering uh, the situation in my uh, homeland of Lebanon as much as uh, uh, I have and probably will. Uh, but certainly uh, the past uh, nine months to a year have been a, a absolute roller coaster. Um, this webinar is, uh, is on the record. Uh, there is uh, a number of journalists who have joined it. Uh, and uh, so thank you for, for taking the time uh, for this. Um, the year 2020, uh, when I look at Twitter, um, you know, a lot of people say worst year ever, um, as if, uh, you know, it relates to their country. And I, I certainly think that Lebanon uh, has a shot. It has to be among the finalists uh, at, at this point. Uh, between the financial economic crisis that was uh, decades in the making, but that really erupted uh, in, in uh, starting October, uh, between uh, uh, the, um, sorry, the financial crisis, uh, between the, the political disarray in Beirut with uh, competition between the actors not leading to uh, better govern governance or uh, the adoption and implementation of reforms. Uh, in addition, with the coronavirus crisis that is spreading very fast in Lebanon uh, at a time where the state is constrained in terms of its uh, uh, ability to respond, uh, to that and its ability to establish trust with the population to actually uh, uh, get uh, people to, to abide by pretty uh, severe uh, restrictions. Uh, add to this uh, the verdict uh, last week in the case of uh, the Trahariri uh, uh, assassination in 2005, uh, which found uh, one individual linked to Hezbollah uh, guilty of, uh, this, uh, um, of this assassination. And finally, uh, you know, the, the massive explosion uh, on uh, August 4 uh, in Beirut that in a way is uh, a, a, the banal, sad uh, and uh, culmination of uh, decades of, of negligence uh, uh, and nepotism. Uh, so, you know, I suspect 2020 will be remembered as a Lebanon worst year. Uh, the question is whether Lebanon has reached, uh, you know, the slowest point and has the ability to rebound, or whether this erosion of state governance, uh, the economy, uh, Lebanon's uh, regional and international relations, and so on, uh, 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 will actually uh, just simply make it worse. So maybe 2021 or 2022 will go down in history as the worst one. Um, I will uh, introduce briefly our, uh, our panelists in a second. Uh, I will take questions in the chat function. Uh, so please uh, 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 type in your, your questions later. And uh, I will run this as a, as a discussion with, uh, with our three panelists. Uh, the first one uh, is Joe Bahout, who is the incoming director of uh, the Rassam Faris Institute at, at AUB. Uh, Joe has traveled the world and uh, is, uh, uh, you know, settling back in Beirut. So I hope this is reason for hope for the rest of us, uh, if he's showing the way. Um, uh, Joe is a, a political sociologist uh, who has worked most recently at the Carnegie Endowment, but uh, has a storied career in, in Paris as well. Uh, Lamia Mbayed Bissat is uh, the head of uh, the Institut de Finance at the Lebanese Ministry uh, of Finance. It's an institute that basically looks at, uh, at governance issues, uh, financial management, public administration. Uh, it is uh, recognized as uh, one of the few places in Lebanon where there is uh, hard thinking about what needs to be done to uh, uh, reform the state and deliver uh, better uh, governance and services. Um, Reem Momtaz is uh, the French correspondent of Politico. Uh, she uh, was at ABC News in the past and served as a journalist uh, in a number of places. Uh, most recently, Reem accompanied uh, President Macron um, to, to Beirut, uh, and she uh, follows uh, closely uh, what France and other key actors are doing vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the Lebanese file. Uh, and Reem will talk about the uh, you know, international uh, uh, diplomacy around Lebanon. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, the three of you, for, for joining us. And I will start with, uh, with Joe uh, and, uh, you know, grill him about, about well, the politics of, uh, of Lebanon. Um, 
we're not going to go in detail about uh, the power sharing structure in Lebanon uh, because I suspect it's well known to, to our audience, uh, the power sharing between the various uh, 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 sex and uh, how uh, this essentially shape how the politics are conducted. Um, but fundamentally, Joe, I'm curious uh, uh, about one big question today is what is the, the domestic balance of power in Lebanon? I mean, has have all these events, all these developments that I just uh, uh, presented, uh, have they transformed the domestic uh, uh, balance of power in pretty uh, significant ways? Uh, does it matter uh, at all? Or because these may be games among the elite that don't necessarily shape the trajectory of the country because of how, how bad uh, things are. So, uh, Joe. Um. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, Emil, for uh, putting up this, uh, this webinar. And I'm very happy to see you personally and to see other friends like Reem and, and Lamia. Uh, of course, as you said, I mean, we're uh, probably all of us spending, uh, I mean, most of our times on, on, on the screen talking about Lebanon on, on webinars and, and other interviews. So uh, probably we'll repeat some of the things and some of them are already well known and, and, and have become maybe uh, sad cliches to our audience. Uh, now, of course, to answer your question, of course, I would say that it, it, uh, it has an importance, of course, because uh, first of all, so far, and despite uh, the, the 10 months of uh, popular protest, uh, politics in Lebanon is still uh, evolving and revolving and shaped by, uh, by the, the classical elite. Uh, of course, with a lot of uh, external interference, and this is something probably Reem will talk about. Uh, so no, we can't say that uh, structurally things have changed and, and uh, the, the, the game is still uh, in the hands of the same let's say, players and stakeholders. Now, within this club of stakeholders, uh, also, uh, I mean, to answer your question, it depends on the, on, on the time length or the time focal of, of, uh, of what you see and how, how long you come back or you, you get back in, in reward. Um, uh, let's say that for the last 15 years, no, the balance of power is well known. It is uh, something that has been produced by uh, the post-2006 uh, uh, events and the war, and then the post-2008 event, which is uh, very important, although a lot of people tend to forget it, the Doha agreement that has uh, altered the, the Taif agreement. Um, then the Arab revolution starting uh, with uh, 2010 and 2011, and uh, culminating with the popular protests. All over this period, of course, uh, the club is still the same and the power sharing is still the same, but within it, and this is where I think we need a more granular approach. Uh, we all know, of course, that uh, Hezbollah and the March 8 coalition, grossly speaking, uh, mainly the tandem between uh, Hezbollah and, and the president, uh, president's camp, I mean, the Aounist movement, is almost um, dictating the line of, of things. Uh, globally, with, of course, a lot of, of minute details and uh, other players come into that. Uh, but let's say that uh, it's been three or four years that the country is governed by this coalition. Uh, le 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 let us put it this way. Now, if we get into more granular thing, if you zoom in a little bit more, here you have a very interesting debate uh, on which I think the answer is not definitive and I, I, I wouldn't dare to, to close it and uh, the jury is still out. How far and how long or how far or how much is Hezbollah eroded by the war in Syria, by the strangulation of Iran, by the sanctions uh, on, uh, on itself and etc. Uh, but let us say that in a nutshell and, and the bottom line, uh, the, the, uh, the party Hezbollah is still uh, having the final say on, on issues. And this is why I think uh, without anticipating on our debate, this is why the next government will probably uh, not see the light if Hezbollah is not agreeing on it. Uh, we will enter then into the, the, gritty, the nitty gritty details of Lebanese politics, but it won't see the light if there's a veto of Hezbollah. Uh, other players, uh, of course, are still potent, but uh, they are probably more eroded than Hezbollah. The question in Lebanon is, okay, Lebanon is today in a very dire situation. 
but who is in a uh, dire situation more than others within the political club. And I think that relatively, uh, albeit all what we see, we hear, and we know, I think that Hezbollah is still relatively stronger than other, uh, than other actors. Now, it remains, and I'll stop there, that there's a newcomer in town, which is the popular protest or the popular force that has started to uh, express vocally, uh, starting with uh, with October 17, and and the movement and the, and and the protests and the streets occupation, but we have to agree and to admit, and I think that Lamia won't disagree with that, that so far. Uh, this movement has not uh, succeeded in, in producing something, let's say, uh, relevant or valuable or up to at least uh, being able to challenge uh, the, the, the quasi-monopoly of the political, the, cl the classical political class in terms of producing an output. Now, of course, there are uh, reasons for that or, uh, let's say, reasons that could explain the failure uh, COVID, uh, the disorganization, the classical disorganization of civil society, although it's a strong civil society in Lebanon, and other issues. But I think that so far, um, we can't say that there's an even match uh, between uh, this popular protest and the classical political class, uh, all shades uh, included or all shades compounded. Uh, and again, and I'll close on that, within which Hezbollah is still uh, the predominant actor. So, uh, Joe, two two questions. Uh, first, uh, practically, I mean, you mentioned the, the the 2008 Doha agreement. I mean, but practically, you know, how does uh, uh, um, uh, Hezbollah influence that process? Is it it does it has a veto right, or are its preferences uh, uh, understood and almost? Uh, uh, um, uh, by, by the rest of the political class, so there, uh, there are red lines that are clearly uh, 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 drawn that you know the whole political class will uh, will will agree to. Uh, so that's the first question. It's like practically because you know there is the sense uh, uh, you know especially in, in a number of Western countries uh, that Hezbollah controls or dominates Lebanon, and I suspect that you know we would agree that that's actually not the case, but that actually Hezbollah primarily has. A, a veto on a number of issues rather than actually being actively in charge of the affairs of the country. And we can discuss whether it's true and, and if, it's, if it is, why it's not. Uh, and then the second question, just because you touched on, on the protests, is that, um, of course, the protest movement, uh, you know, captured the imagination. It was a turning point. But the, what, I'm, um, what I, I want to get to is that if after financial collapse that is affecting, you know, every aspect of, of life in Lebanon at this point, uh, and after this massive explosion, a protest movement is not able to turn into a political force and generate ideas, uh, then perhaps the protest movement is, you know, just irrelevant to the future of the country. I mean, which is a would be a sad place to be, uh, and certainly uh, not my, my personal preference. But the point here is that, you know, if, if, it, if the, the explosion, an explosion that destroys part of the port and part of the capital is not enough to focus minds on, uh, you know, the need for wholesale reform, then perhaps, you know, the protest movement should not get the attention that it's actually getting. So I'm just curious about your views on these two points. Okay, on the, on the first question, uh, the same applies. It depends on, on the time, let's say, span that you, that you adopt to answer it. Let's put it in a nutshell since 2005 till today. After the Syrian withdrawal and Hariri's assassination, uh, Hezbollah took uh, probably a greater role in domestic politics. So far, the the bargaining or the equilibrium was that uh, the Syrian tutelage in Lebanon was dictating uh, the domestic details and, and, and other issues, of course, and Hezbollah was uh, primarily concerned uh, with its regional and uh, strategic, let's say, grand game, uh, essentially in the south and etc. With the Syrian uh, withdrawal and the Syrian's influence waning in Lebanon and then after with the revolution in Syria and, and the fact that the regime was sucked by, was, was sinked into its own affairs, Hezbollah has been uh, dragged on uh, increasingly into uh, small details of Lebanese governance. Here there's a huge debate. I won't give my own opinion, but uh, 
Some people say that Hezbollah wanted to take over much more than before. Uh, and some people would argue that Hezbollah was not very much at ease with that. It would have probably preferred not to get into the small Lebanese intricacies of governance, of even corruption and nepotism and etc. because this is something of uh, a draining for its own resources uh, uh, with respect to the grand game. I don't know exactly uh, what is the truth about that, but I think that this needs to be examined on a file by file uh, case. Uh, and here is uh, the second point to your answer. I think that on macro domestic issues, Hezbollah is in fact dictating uh, the course of things in terms of uh, choosing the president, uh, probably shaping uh, the, the contours of a national unity government that it uh, still prefers. And I think this is something to, to, to underline, just to remind the Western audience that probably sometimes functions on very simplistic ideas. Uh, when the Hariri government resigned after the popular protests, the only and prominent force that really insisted on Hariri staying at the head of the government was Hezbollah itself. So this uh, breaks a little bit uh, the idea, the, the, the idée reçue or the cliché uh, around which we, we, func we often function on this country. Now, uh, I think that the economic collapse, and this is point three, the economic collapse was really, I think, uh, the, 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 let's say the, the threat that Hezbollah didn't want to face. Uh, first of all, because this uh, really endangers and jeopardizes Hezbollah's social base itself. And this is something that could erode Hezbollah's grip on its own society. And second, because Hezbollah knows that it doesn't have the economic culture uh, to deal with this. It doesn't have the bandwidth to deal with this. And it doesn't have the means to, de to deal with it, um, especially in a country that uh, despite everything we can say or wish for, uh, in a country that is very extroverted economically, that needs uh, foreign capital and foreign aid and, and foreign fluxes and etc. So uh, I think that Hezbollah still dictates things. Of course, what is happening, mainly the economic collapse, uh, is frightening uh, Hezbollah. But I think that we have to understand, and uh, Emil, you know it uh, maybe probably better than uh, many analysts around us, uh, Hezbollah is a kind of political actor that still functions around uh, the predominance of the politics more than the economics and other issues. As we say in France, it's la primauté du politique. They are still first and foremost a political actor for them uh, everything economic is a variable, is an adjustment variable. It could be fixed, but they will not, I think, unless really seriously under duress, uh, negotiate or let over anything macro-political in the name of uh, an economic uh, pressure or leverage. And this is something that probably the West, uh, if I can say broadly speaking, does not always uh, understand with Hezbollah and, and regarding Lebanon. Now, the second question, I'll be briefer because it's, uh, it's more harsh, let's say, or it's more severe. Uh, without flagellating uh, ourselves or the Lebanese society or the Lebanese protest movement and etc., cetera, I, I fear that uh, the future uh, event, I mean, the, 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 the near future will prove you right, maybe. You know, everybody in Lebanon and, and outside Lebanon, I was on a webinar two days ago and someone was saying exactly what you said, that if something uh, of the magnitude of the Beirut blast doesn't really shake uh, the bases of uh, the political life, not only the political class, class but I mean, everything we're living uh, 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 within, in Lebanon for the last 20 years, if this blast, something of this magnitude, regardless of the reasons, regardless of what happened and et cetera, doesn't really shift or erode or shake the pillars of Lebanese politics, maybe we, could, we should start to think that this country, I wouldn't say is doomed, but uh, should look at other ways of conducting its affairs and conducting the necessary change within it. So far, and Emil, I'm, I'm very measured here because I don't want to take risks, intellectual risks, okay? So far, uh, let, let us just keep this in mind. 20 days exactly, 21 days exactly have been uh, spent or wasted since this blast. 
I don't see so far any glimpse of national wide surge, a feeling of, uh, let's say, fed up or uh, a, a kind of uh, let's get into something different in the country. I think the entire debate is still very largely business as usual. Uh, of course, uh, except some marginal issues like the civil society, for example, admirably organizing in uh, helping people in maybe saving uh, the, the architectural heritage in, in the city, in helping the people that have been uh, uprooted from their houses and etc. But this is not politics. This is uh, normal civil society action. So far, I still don't see the reflex that would show that things will get played differently in the country in the months or in the period to come. And this is something really unfortunate and maybe despairing. I hope, I seriously hope and sincerely hope that my two other colleagues on the screen will have uh, a different view and contradict me and I would be happy to, to be proven wrong. Thank you, thank you, Joe. I mean, perhaps instead of like complacency or business as usual, we can characterize this as in Arabic, the word is about, I mean, a general, you know, a, 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 I mean, I would, I don't know how to translate it at this point, a crushing of the soul in a way that, you know, it's a, it's a, 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 a that is across a, a, a class and, and sectarian lines. Uh, but we you know we'll, we'll discuss this. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, Lamia. I mean, uh, I think your... the technical word is depression. Yeah, yeah, depression, but but a bit more, I, I suspect, uh, uh, than this. Um, Lamia, you, you're one of the you know people uh, who have thought the most about you know what is needed to reform the country, what better governance would look like uh, at an institutional level, and so on. So. I'm, I'm just curious, how do you assess today the, the performance, the capacity, the competence, the resilience of the Lebanese state? Um, you know, is it able to manage the, the crisis uh, uh, that, uh, that it's facing uh, right now? Is, it, is, is, it, is there a sense of, of direction or is it a moment of, uh, uh, of total loss of, of uh, you know, sense of purpose and, and so on? So, you know, I, I mean, we can be perhaps too harsh uh, in, in, in assessing uh, the, the Lebanese state. Uh, but very often, you know, the one institution that we talk about positively uh, is the military. Uh, but, you know, I take no comfort from that. I mean, usually you don't, you don't necessarily have to, you know, the security institution shouldn't be the, the main pillar on which the, the country's stability uh, uh, rests. So I'm curious, how do you think about, about the rest? Especially, you know, you, you, you're affiliated with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, you know, there are lots of questions today about whether, uh, you know, reform can spring from, from the ministry. Uh, thank you, Emil and everybody. Listen, uh, on a personal note first, I mean, a person like me and many people like me would not have continued to do what they are doing, uh, except for this very beautiful uh, thing called hope. And I think uh, that despite, you know, the blast, we always, you know, keep on hitting on the negative uh, sides and totally forget that this is a country that has the highest uh, per capita creativity in the whole MENA region. And I'm not saying this uh, just to uh, market or communicate. Uh, if you went to the street of Beirut two or three days after the blast, you would have seen that in less than a few days, people were able to actually uh, clean up the street. I went and walked and, and I could even ask myself, oh, where, are, where did they put the rubble? I mean, how did they move all this? Uh, there is an energy on the streets. There, is, um, there are uh, wonderful initiatives springing from the civil society, of course, but there are many things that are being done on so many other fronts to help Lebanon and they are conducted by Lebanese and they are also pushed by international. So um, yes, the word uh, shock is there, but uh, a person like me and who also have lived and survived during uh, a very tough civil war and a very also uh, tough post-war uh, tend to see the th always 
the positive sides. And I, I think that one of the most important thing in the post-trauma period is to just stress on uh, the positiveness that we can engender from this uh, drama. This is not to say that we, or we do not see the shortcomings, that we do not see the problems in themselves. Uh, uh, the disaster was triggered by, uh, by the deficiencies in governments, but not only in government. It, it, is, it was triggered by our methods of work, be it in the private sector or the public sector, our high tolerance to corruption, our high tolerance to mismanagement, to breaking the standards and the rules uh, for uh, easy money. Uh, our also acceptance of uh, laws for civil service who accepted uh, conflicts of interest, nepotism, crinism, uh, non-meritocratic recruitment. We've composed with that and we did not oppose it enough. Our ways of handling responsibility at the level of the political side, but also at the level of the administration side, uh, uh, shuffling papers, kicking the cans. And this is not only a feature again, of the public sector, but also of the private sector, who very much was in bed with that. So the value system uh, that privileged all these loose standards, the easy money, the easy wealth, uh, in a sense, uh, is responsible for, for what we are battling. And we need to draw the lessons, assume the responsibility, clean up probably the value system, and definitely go back to the real problems of the administration, of the state, which are, uh, if I want to summarize them in three, capacity, cost, and fragility. And on capacity, yes, structural vulnerabilities have been there um, since we've accepted the uh, uh, militias to basically become the ruling, uh, the new ruling elite after the war uh, with very little accountability. So um, the shortage and depletion of skills of course, uh, de deprived us from uh, capacity to cope with crises, and especially crises like that. Um, political pressure made it hard on the bureaucracy to handle the multidimensional crisis. The cost we pushed into government people from all um, walks of life and, and all sorts without uh, prerogatives for high talent in a country where the market for talent is amazing. So these push and pull dynamics between consensus sharing and rentier economies and elite capture became the root cause of the inefficiencies of the impunities and made cost us a lot, cost us 9% of GDP annually. This, is, uh, this was an estimate in 2015. And uh, if you look at the um, citizen budget that our institute produced, you would see easily that <laughs> the wage bill is more than 50% of, um, of expenditure. So problem of capacity, problem of cost, all leading to um, an extreme fragility. So uh, Lebanon government and the government bureaucracy was ranked among the top four more most problematic factor for doing business. So the effect went on to the larger economy and in, it turned um, uh, this problem into a, a, a quite a unique uh, uh, Lebanese fragility um, uh, tag. Uh, Lebanon did not invest in standards, did not invest in infrastructure, in IT infrastructure, did not invest in processes and procedures. And for the past basically 20 years or so, we've been working with um, a whole wave counter working against us. So. We uh, put pressures on reducing the wage bill, but then again, the political cronism and uh, the push and pull factor uh, if, uh, render the bureaucracy a place for uh, social employment. We've been warning, uh, putting high warning on the fra fragility of the state, on the cost of the state, um, uh, but all these uh, indicators uh, did not go, go through, uh, if you want, this uh, maze of um, political um, fragility and also of societal fragility. Thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you for the note of optimism at the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, I, I suspect uh, uh, there are others who will tell us uh, the same. So, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm hoping that hope uh, can uh, can be the the fuel that we need uh, right now. 
Uh, it's, if, uh, if, I it's, may, if I may, yeah. Emil, because I, I uh, act actually dismissed uh, your question on the military, and I think what I described is is uh, is symptomatic of the whole system. Yeah. So just pulling, you know, one sector out of the whole uh, others um, uh, is totally uh, illogical. No, no, I, 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 I get the point. Thank you for, for this, uh, this assessment. I mean, I, I want you to help us uh, do something. We, we talk about uh, a lot about the need for reforms uh, for Lebanon. And obviously, right now, whether it's negotiations with the IMF or with other foreign funders who basically condition any assistance to a deal with the IMF, it's a, th that's the key word, right? Reforms, uh, early reforms, high conditionality, uh, none of the complacency in the past. Lebanon has been, uh, you know, in a way, the spoiled child of the international community for a very long time. Uh, there was, you know, lots of funding, but no, none of the promises in terms of reforms and, and, and better management of the state have ever been uh, uh, implemented. Today, what are we talking about? What are the most necessary, urgent reforms uh, that we need? I mean, put aside the issue of of investment, right? The idea of the said uh, 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 French plan of, of 2018 and so on. But structurally, what does Lebanon need in terms of, of reforms? Where would you start if you, you know, uh, uh, were in charge or if, if you were advising a, a, a senior uh, uh, official abroad? Um, we've been around a lot to know that uh, the most urgent reform are those linked to the use of the limited resources the country has meaning money and meaning civil service. Uh, of course, with a very strong lens on accountability and on the value, uh, the best value for uh, spending uh, money or spending resources. But prior to discussing reform, there is an amazing uh, need for the right diagnostic to be made. So, um, and I think this is the sometimes missed as a first step. Uh, uh, because evidence is the cornerstone to any vision and uh, we tend to move into just, you know, listing reforms without um, actually having enough or proper thinking, proper evidence, evidence-based policy making that allow us not only to identify the reform, but actually to sequentialize them, meaning which reform should come first and prior and would affect the others. Um, in my point of view, there and this is only personal. I think um, public procurement reform and all of similar reforms that are whole of governments that um, they, uh, uh, if you want to break the silo thinking, the silo doing, are those that are the most urgent now. So uh, procurement reform, for example, is um, not only a, um, a corruption related reform, but it's a um, definitely linked to uh, SMEs, to competition, to um, transparency, to better use of public money, to sustainability in terms of consumption and producing, um, consuming uh, uh, goods uh, and services. And this law can change the way the government does business um, also, and as we know, governments are the major spender. Another very important reform is civil service, because a civil service is, is important to achieve efficiency, but it is also a uh, way to put back the values of service, the va values of account accountability, the value of professionalism and professionalization, um, and building, building, building the state, the whole you know, dream of building a fair state. Uh, civil service was also a way to safeguard the diversity of the Lebanese society while at the same time putting up the uh, values of professionalization, efficiencies, and efficacy. So it's a value changing reform. Um, definitely, we talk about fiscal reforms, be it on the tax side or on the expenditure side, but also financial sector reform because these reforms also are not only strictly technical, but they are linked to a whole set of behavior, uh, the set of behavior that I talked about at the start uh, of our conversation. Do, do you think that, uh, you know, a deal with the IMF is, you know, the essential uh, 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 starter of such a process, or is this a process that can happen 
regardless of, of that. I mean, the country is in such a dire situation right now that, you know, when we look at the reserves of the, of the central bank, we're talking about, you know, an ability to import essential goods three, four months down the road. Uh, so, you know, this, you know, all what you're talking about, about reform, you need a space, you need a population that is not starving and can, uh, you know, uh, uh, get uh, basic uh, medicines and, and so on. So is the IMF deal an essential step uh, 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 to start all this, or you know, are we being? Uh, is there other ways to uh, to jumpstart this uh, uh, this effort? Well, I wish I wish I could answer you differently, but um, if you take the opportunities that are open to Lebanon now, we any you know reasonable human being would say that there is no way to do without an IMF deal. And, um, Dealing with an IMF deal uh, uh, and working with the requirements of, uh, of the IMF requires, on the other side, um, the capacity to do that. And this capacity is uh, today missing in government. Um, this is why I think that one of the most important um, points um, for the new government would be to have a national team and with high quality um, uh, people with lots of, uh, if you want, credibility vis-a-vis -vis the international community who are able to set a national agenda and who are able also to implement a, a, the plan or to negotiate and discuss and then prepare the implementation of the plan, of course, in a consultative manner and in tandem with the civil society. But we cannot do without the IMF. But again, uh, because IMF instills discipline, IMF will also bring other international uh, donors. Uh, but the, I think one of the major challenges today is to have a national team who is able to have a constructive dialogue with IMF with a national agenda, with a national uh, view on the priorities of the country. Well, I mean, that, that takes us to a point that Joe was making earlier, which is what new government uh, will uh, uh, will take shape in, in the coming weeks or months. I mean, in Lebanon can drag months. Um, and, you know, a, a, what kind of, of a government is needed to actually jumpstart those, those reforms? I mean, people are talking about the national unity government. And I can tell you, I'm just now in London, when people hear national unity government, they say, great, a time of acute crisis this is what you need, a national unity government, as if you know, that was the answer to, uh, to the problems. But those of us who have studied Lebanon uh, know that actually political paralysis, inertia, and power sharing uh, of, uh, sharing of rents and, and uh, state income and state capture happen a lot you know, while you have national unity government, because they're essentially a political compromise between the various factions, and there is much less accountability and transparency when there is a national unity government, because everyone has a stake in in keeping this, the the uh, uh, the system as is. So, you know, is there? I mean, and the question is open, also open to to Joe on on that one. I mean, you know. I'm not going to tell you, tell me what's the most likely outcome of, uh, of the current process, but what is, you know, what is needed in terms of the governance of the country uh, today? So there are some, ideas, some people will defend national unity government and say, there's no way around it. Others will say, no, that's, that such a government will not deliver what, what the country needs, what also the IMF and others require. And actually, you need a, a technocratic government, at least as a in a transitional phase, to actually negotiate with the IMF and rebuild some of the trust with, with the population. So I have, I'm, I'm curious, do you have any opinion about, uh, about this? Lamia first and then Joe. Well, um, I mean, I, I don't think anybody today in his own, you know, uh, state of mind, a good state of mind would um, accept uh, the fact that uh, business as usual is going to lead the game in the next uh, uh, phase. It's, it's going to be a, an, an incredibly difficult uh, phase on Lebanon. You have seen the latest ESQA report, which talked about uh, mounting poverty, uh, a shrinking of middle class. I mean, all reports numbers of people who are leaving the country. So there is a rapid and serious action that is needed there. And this, how the political brokers uh, will be um, uh, handling that, I'm not sure Joe is better. But from uh, what I sense is there is a 
um, a, a kind of a dichotomy. At the same time, people um, in the political arena understand very well the necessity to compose a, a, a government uh, with a small number of high quality, high competence individual because the issues are require unquestionable, if you want, experience network and, and the track record. But at the same time, the disconnect with the power structure is not yet mature, is, uh, and the ruling elite will find it very difficult to uh, leave the game. What is importantly, uh, 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 I think, foundational for the coming period is the, that the engagement of civil society power groups um, uh, validate the solution and, and be there to actually push and pressure for creating a positive dynamis, uh, dynamics. You cannot just not move from zero um, uh, power structure, from, from a very entrenched, rooted power structure uh, uh, to a uh, completely, you know, uh, the dream team uh, that we need today. But um, will this, um, will the society be able to create or, or bring about a positive dynamic for the coming, coming period not to be um, uh, very tough. That's the big question today. And Joe has all the answers. So Joe, uh, what's your answer to him? <laughs> um, uh, look, uh, w w when you say that uh, people in, in normal countries, quote unquote, say that in such times you need a national unity government, this is very logical, but it assumes that uh, the, the type of governments and government that led uh, the country to uh, the state in which it is, uh, was a majoritarian government of some kind. I mean, if the Labour Party in, in the UK has led uh, the UK to the situation, to the shumble situation that Lebanon is into, yes, to repair it, you need a, a national unity government. But what you have to say to your uh, British interlocutors or others, and what I would say, and what I say, is that exactly the national unity governments in Lebanon has led us, uh, have led us to where we are. So, uh, so the, the cure and the remedy is definitely uh, not what caused uh, the illness. So this is a very specific case. Now, second, uh, I, I wouldn't say what kind of government uh, is needed. I would ask myself, and this is exactly what Lamia has, has tried to answer, what is required in the coming two years? What is the agenda in the coming two years? For me, it's definitely first stop uh, the economic collapse and death because we're no more in the collapse. We're in the, in the quasi coma. Stop it and reverse it and start to put the country on the, on, on the track of uh, recovery and etc. This is the huge first point of the agenda. The second one is more political, but I would restrict it to maybe one thing, how to uh, start to bridge the gap between uh, the popular mood, I wouldn't say the popular will, and here civil society and etc., and the political system. And here you enter in a, in a very, I mean, technical, concrete debate about early elections, not early elections, how to reorganize political life. But to focus on only one of these points would be, I think, uh, deadly and a, a, a loss of time. So if you agree that this government will have to tackle and to, and to take on these two challenging points, the economics, I mean, the economic situation, negotiating with IMF, with the international community, stopping the collapse, putting the country on track again. And second, rejuvenating a kind of livable, uh, let's say, feasible political life. The kind of government that you need is forcibly not the kind of government that you had so far. So here you start to shape the contours of the new government. Uh, without entering into details and dream will probably, I think that the kind of idea that Emmanuel Macron has put forward in the second phase, not when he said, and he said it, and I think he should admit that he said it uh, 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 wrongly, that he, he wanted a national unity government, but a, a government of mission that has a political consensus around it, that is a wide consensus, I think this is now the new formula uh, by, by France and, and President Macron. I think that such a government could, could, and I underline could with all the limitations and the caveats, 
could take on this task, provided the political class, the classical political class, is aware enough of the, let's say, of the hole into which it is, so that it will handle, at least momentarily, the keys of the decision to such a to such a political gov to such a government. Because before, be, be, without that, it is a kind of illusion to think that a government of technocrats that come from the best corporations in the world and etc. will be able to do anything. First of all, a, a, a technocrat doesn't have a political opinion. Uh, a technocrat is a doer, he's an executive. So we don't need only technocrats, we need people with ideas. And we need people with ideas that are in harmony. Because if you bring a technocrat that will tell you, I want to nationalize banks because this is the best technocratic answer. And another one who will tell you, I want to privatize the state and this is the best technocratic answer. You, both of them can be excellent in their field but if they sit together in a government, this government will be a complete nonsense. So uh, I think that, that the way of answering things is to ask ourselves, what are today the priority tasks to, to, to stop the death of the country? And then we will see how to do it. Maybe another answer is, is possible, but I think that we need to get the agenda and the roadmap first. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm going to turn to Reem, uh, who's been patient uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is that uh, she traveled with uh, President Macron to, uh, to Beirut uh, the, the day uh, after the, the explosion. Um, and uh, President Macron seems to be quite popular, or a uh, number of people see him as a, as a potential savior. Uh, I don't see Sorry, he sees himself as, as such. Expectations are, are quite high. Uh, so let me start by asking you, OK, we had a spectacular visit, lots of expectations. But what can Paris really do? And what is Paris thinking? I mean, is Paris busy uh, uh, building a consensus among the key uh, countries that are interested in Lebanon? Uh, so, you know, the US, uh, Saudi, you know, other uh, important players. Or is Paris uh, uh, freelancing? Uh, you know, to what extent is uh, Macron's diplomacy coordinated with others? Uh, and what is the real leverage uh, that uh, that France has? Uh, is it is it incentives? Is Paris thinking in terms of punishing Lebanese politicians who somehow uh, uh, you know complicate uh, the road to recovery? You know, whether it's legitimate or why it's the same, it's a different matter. So I'm just curious about uh, uh, how you see it from uh, from Paris. Right, so there are many, many points in, in that question, so let me take them uh, one by one. It's true that uh, Macron's visit to Lebanon so quickly after the explosion, he was the first uh, sort of foreign leader to go to Lebanon. He remains the highest level officials to, uh, official to have visited Lebanon. That has definitely kind of set the tone. Uh, and yes, there are very high expectations. Some, some may think they're impossible expectations, really. Um, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Lebanese, but I, I cover President Macron. I, this is my job. And so it was interesting to be with him in that bubble in Lebanon so quickly after the explosion, because I could hear and see my fellow Lebanese citizens, the way they were reacting to him being there, but also contrast that with the, the mood and what, you know, the, the sort of the, the people around Macron, the officials around him himself were saying. And, you know, there's a bit of a gap. It was very striking when we got to Jemaize, people first thought that it was President Tron, the Lebanese president who was coming in the car and people reacted very angrily. They were denouncing him. They were basically saying, don't, don't come. And then when they realized that it was President Macron, their mood shifted and they kind of hailed him and welcomed him, um, even though there was a lot of nervous energy and you could feel, it wasn't just nervous, it was, it was desperate. It was people literally asking to be saved and they actually said the word, save us from President Aoun, save us from Hezbollah, save us from this political class. I mean, all of these sentences were said. We were in the street for about 45 minutes. Um, and 
while Macron kind of received that energy because he he's the kind of person who feeds off of the energy of other people around him, um, it was interesting. He wasn't trying to say, I'm coming to save you and I'm going to bring back the French protectorate, for example. Even though in that street, one person, I was really struck, told him, a young man told him, we're, we're close to the street, uh, you know, named after General Gouraud. Uh, you know, you should be the, the 2020 General Gouraud. That's not at all what President Macron was trying to do or what his advisors believe France should, should be doing. So after that, obviously, he went and he met with sort of the, the current leaders, then the, the leaders of the parliamentary groups and, and the civil society, all one after the other. Um, and as Joe said, you know, he did say two things that raised eyebrows in Lebanon. Uh, perhaps he didn't realize what they sounded like and what they evoked in the Lebanese mind. So, you know, at the beginning, he said uh, he's here to suggest a way uh, and to, to help shepherd uh, sort of a new political system, a new national pact. In the Lebanese mind, that means a constitution. And during his press conference, it was the question that I asked him, you know, what do you mean by that? Because the Lebanese believe that it means a constitution. And he was very clear in his answer. He said, I'm the French president. It is not my job to discuss you know, neither a Lebanese constitution nor really go into the details of the composition of a French, of a Lebanese government. Um, on the question of talking about uh, the need for a government of national unity in Lebanon, um, it was clearly suggested to him by certain political leaders that he met with, certain Lebanese political leaders. Um, and perhaps he didn't necessarily uh, sort of measure what that means and, and the precedent that exists on national unity governments, as you said, Emil, in Lebanon. And his advisors very quickly explained that what is meant by national unity government coming out of the mouth of President Macron is more along the lines of what uh, Joe said, which is, you know, a government that has as wide uh, a support politically as possible in order for it to be effective. Um, and so the expectations are very high. He is supposed to go back uh, at the beginning of, of next week to commemorate the centenary of, uh, you know, the, the French declaring uh, modern Lebanon. Um, that is September 1st. There's been a lot of rumors in Lebanon saying that he is going to cancel. It, there seems to be a political play here by certain political parties. Um, so you feel that the French initiative um, is, is facing some difficulties. Is the French initiative uh, coordinated with other international partners? It's very difficult to say yes or no because it's all shades of gray, right? What we did see for sure in terms of a concrete um, uh, manifestation of that is that two days after, or a day and a half after Macron went to Lebanon, he and his team were able to put together uh, a, a pretty well attended international conference for international emergency humanitarian aid um, with the notable uh, participation of the US president, uh, Donald Trump, which as you know, and as our, our, our listeners know, you know, the US has taken on a policy of maximum pressure against Lebanon, uh, specifically targeting uh, Hezbollah um, and had continued to say, you know, despite the, the, the sort of live webcast um, decline and collapse of Lebanon, they were not willing to kind of step in. And here they did take part in this conference. It was notable though that Turkey and Russia did not participate in that conference. So you start seeing some of the, some of the, uh, you know, divisions. And of course we saw that the Iranian foreign minister uh, Jawad Zarif went to Lebanon uh, shortly after President Macron and uh, his comments, if you read between the lines, were not exactly supportive of the French um, initiative. And so these are also all the different um, variables that the French initiative right now or attempted mediation, I know diplomats don't like the word mediation because they take it in a certain way, but for the layman, uh, mediation uh, is having to, to deal with and compose with and and you know, France definitely doesn't hold all of the answers and all of the le levers but it does have 
quite an interesting and unique hand to play in Lebanon. Let's not forget that President Macron is the highest level foreign leader to have met with a Hezbollah official or leader. He met with the leader of the Hezbollah parliamentary group. That is very significant. Even the uh, Lebanese president said the next day, you know, President Macron uh, broke the isolation. Very interesting, right? Also, President Aoun owes quite a bit to France. Let's not forget that, you know, 1989, 1990, he, he found refuge in, in France and there's that relationship as well. Um, President Macron, as we just said, was the person who kind of was able to shepherd at least some emergency funds that are very direly needed. Um, so there are these measures. Now, is it more carrots than sticks? That's, I think, the, the, the central issue that we have to figure out when it comes to the French uh, position. What I do know is that um, President Macron, when he met with the uh, leaders of the parliamentary groups, he was quite honest and direct with them. As he said at, the, at his press conference, you know, he, he told them very clearly that uh, there had been too much corruption, that they had um, stolen from the state coffers way too much, um, and that that needed to stop, you know, that there needed to be a financial audit and, and you know, the French suggested that Banque de France do it and the, and the French Treasury. That doesn't seem to be currently what is um, planned. Um, so, you know, he, he said that and there was sort of vague, vague talk of sanctions, not targeted towards anyone specifically, but that stick is there. Is that going to be enough to move things? I think Joe said something very important about Hezbollah, which at the end of the day really is um, kind of the, the, the central player right now, without which you cannot actually get anywhere constructive. Um, Hezbollah has, you know, its own political kind of prerogatives and, and red lines. And it's not very, I think, uh, it doesn't seem to be at least, it's not behaving like it's very open to uh, sort of the economic incentives. Um, so the question is, can France, given the Iranian-American standoff, give way to some sort of compromise on Lebanon, given Hezbollah's centrality? That's not an answer I can currently, an uh, that's not a question I can currently answer. Yeah, I mean, one interpretation of what's happening is that the, the France is playing good cop and, and the U.S. is, uh, uh, is playing bad cop in, in this. So the, the, the U.S. comes, uh, it, uh, it uh, lists individuals, entities, etc. on uh, its sanctions list and, and, and so on. Uh, but then the, the, the declarations of uh, senior uh, U.S. officials like David Hale and others are like, uh, are not as extreme as uh, one might think, you know, as if they're, they're keeping a, a space open for French diplomacy to, to deliver something. The danger is that uh, the Lebanese political process uh, takes forever to put governments together. Uh, and there is no reason to expect that it's going to be different this time. Uh, I think everyone is in a hurry to have a new government except uh, Lebanese politicians or the president himself. I'm not even sure that the mandatory uh, uh, consultations uh, to form a government have started uh, three weeks after the government, uh, you know, has, has resigned. So it tells you something about, about it. Uh, you know, yesterday I, I was sitting and looking, uh, reading the, the political coverage of Lebanon. You might almost forget that you had a massive explosion three weeks ago when you look at the reporting of this person meeting with this other person and the kind of government formulas that are, uh, are being drawn. Uh, so, you know, uh, the danger for friends here, and, and I'm gonna, I want to have your view on this Reem, but also you, uh, Joe, is that, uh, you know, Macron arrives on September 4th, uh, 1st and uh, there's no government at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very symbolic visit, uh, but not much can be done afterward. Uh, the negotiations over a national unity government go nowhere or they produce a, a very weak government with yet another, uh, you know, a, 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 a prime minister who is not widely embraced uh, and with a government of, you know, normal faces. And then you know, the momentum, I mean, in a very sad way, the momentum that started after the explosion, this wave of international sympathy, so on, is wasted. 
And then France and Macron say, you know what? I tried for a few weeks. I, I gave Lebanon more attention that it actually deserves, perhaps. Uh, you know, it is not one of the big strategic issues of, uh, of, uh, of today. Um, and then, you know, then suddenly the country slides uh, uh, altogether and, and for a long time. So, I mean, you know, this is the grim scenario uh, out there. Um, I'm curious, Reem, I mean, you know, are the French, you know, aware of that danger? Do they care? Uh, or are they, you know, is it a good face effort in which they say, you know, at the end of the day, we cannot help you more than, than you want to help yourself. Uh, you know, Jean-Yves Le Drian said, uh, 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 bon sang. Bon sang. Uh, that's to be polite. Yes. So I'm curious about your take here. So, you know, there is a bit of cognitive dissonance there because you, you would be uh, sort of forgiven to, to think that perhaps President Macron feels more urgency to resolve this than the actual Lebanese politicians who are in charge of, supposedly in charge of supposedly governing this country. Um, and, but unfortunately also, it's all too expected, right? I mean, I think you and I talked when I, when I got back from, from Lebanon and being Lebanese, having grown up there, having grown up watching the, the, the politics, we could expect, we could almost write out what just happened over the past three weeks, you know, the dilly-dallying, the, um, the, the, the politicking, the uh, trying to, uh, you know, make deals here and there, the wheeling and dealing, as if the country isn't crumbling beneath their, their feet, as if people are, haven't been made homeless, as if 40% of the Lebanese capital hasn't kind of, you know, suffered drastic damage. But this is the Lebanese system, right? It's an entrenched political system. And the big question today with this very big Macron gamble is, is he able, will he be able to, to make it move? I don't think any of us can answer that today. What I do know is that uh, President Macron has definitely been very personally involved and engaged in these Lebanese talks. He has spent a lot of time calling the various Lebanese politicians, but also the various uh, international actors that have interests in Lebanon. He is in that position, as we were just discussing, to be able to speak to both Trump and Rouhani, et cetera, et cetera. What happens if he gets to Lebanon and the parliamentary consultations haven't led to anything or, you know, are lasting the last, I mean, they could last 50 days, they could last 100 days, there's no time limitation in the Lebanese constitution for these, for these consultations. Um, what happens if he gets there and the, the nominated prime minister is someone from one certain party and not really representative of, uh, you know, all the various uh, political powers that are, that, that in Macron's head should all be combined in, into one government. And what happens if this, you know, he gets there and there's no, not even a shred of the beginning of, uh, you know, the financial audit that really should have started ages ago um, and uh, any kind of, you know, political reforms that may lead to uh, sort of diffusing some of the tension between the street and, and the politicians. I don't know. Joe, do you have something more optimistic to offer us? Yeah, uh, look, uh, if you remember, just before we started this webinar, it, it was off the record, but uh, I, I was telling uh, Reem that I would take the bet, and I'm still taking it, uh, that, that this visit will be probably cancelled last minute. Maybe I'll be wrong, but uh, conceptually, I think that this visit today, if I was one of Macron's advisors, I would really staunchly advise not to come to Lebanon. Uh, because of the reasons that were uh, laid out. I mean, uh, just the listing of things that should be done before the visit, uh, for this visit to be considered not only a success, but for Macron to be up to his words. I just remember, remind you something about something. Macron said, I would come back on September 1st to acknowledge and see the progresses that have been made after this roadmap that we agreed upon in my meetings with X and Y and Z. After this, the political landscape has changed. We have a government that has resigned. We have a political class, as Reem said, and Lamia, who has re reverted back to its old habits. And we have a loss of the momentum from uh, the, po the, the popular protest. Just a reminder, uh, Emil, we are August 26. There are still five days or four days and a half before this visit. I mean, if you want to do the listing that Reem has just listed 
uh, of things to do before the visit. I mean, even in a very normal and functional country, this is almost impossible. So now it's up to Emmanuel Macron to choose politically. And this is a, a French political uh, choice. I mean, it's a loss of political capital inside France itself. If he wants to come for a photo opportunity just to commemorate the centennial of a country that is almost dying, that France has very much contributed to create, but that is dying today, or if he prefers to say that I tried my best, the Lebanese are worse than I thought, and this is exactly what Le Drian said before uh, the explosion, so I'm leaving this uh, up to the future. Now, uh, more seriously, second point, let's put this into perspective. You said it yourself. I mean, two weeks before the explosion, okay, the French posture, and here I, I mean, I, I almost know what, what I'm talking, and we all know it. The French posture, the French posture was one of fed up, uh, one of saying, look, uh, you haven't done anything for the three last years, not only the five last months. So uh, if you don't do anything, we can't help you. And there was a kind of uh, concrete signs of disinterest towards Lebanon. One of them was the choice of the ambassador of France that is, is supposed to come in September or October, okay? Now, the explosion, the Beirut blast, created a kind of moral human electroshock that prompted Macron to come, and this was very welcome and very, I mean, very welcome by the Lebanese population and, and itself, by itself, it was a good gesture. But this doesn't change or alter the political, I mean, in cold-blooded analysis, and Macron is someone that uh, has a lot of personal energy, as Reem said, but at the same time, he's a very cold-blooded political player. In cold-blooded analysis, the sympathy and the explosion and uh, let's say the, the, this kind of, of, uh, of extraordinary event will not obliterate the fact, and Macron was very uh, blunt in saying that in Lebanon, that my sympathy that is unconditional and the help uh, producing $275 million will not change the structurals. The structurals are still the same. If you Lebanese don't do what you have to do, we will not budge. We will not be more generous than we decided to be before the blast. And this will not change. So if Macron comes within the same mindset, I think that he takes the risk of uh, being rebuffed by the Lebanese reality. Now it's up to him in terms of political communication to calibrate that. On, on the French scene. Now, last point uh, regarding the, the, the more global picture. I think also that the, the chiasm or the, the gap between the French and the American position that was prevalent since October 17 until today is still the same. The American policy in the Middle East, uh, Hale said one thing, but it was a a very, I mean, very hollow, let's say, expression, but the American uh, administration is still on the same line. The maximal pressure will go on until the last day of the Trump administration on Iran and Lebanon and etc. This is why also the Gulf will not budge and will not put money into this envelope. Now, the French position and posture is still the same since last December when there was a meeting in Paris between the French, the Brits and, and the Americans saying that Lebanon is per se a country we have an interest into, we want to help it because of itself and not as a pawn within uh, the regional chessboard. This position is still the same. However, the amount of political carrots or economic carrots that France can put on the table for this to change the political equation in Lebanon is, according to me, and I think that Reem will agree, is not enough to move things and to change the equation. So I think that in a nutshell, and, and, to, and to close on that, I think that despite the gesturing, and it is a welcome gesturing of Macron over Lebanon, I think that nothing will really change in the equation in this country before we really know what this Iranian-American standoff is going. Uh, and where it is going, and what is the result of the, the, the American policy uh, towards Lebanon in the coming months. So this is why I think that Macron filled a gap when he came the first time. 
Now, if he does it again, I think that he's taking the risk of not only filling a gap, but of uh, getting engulfed himself in the Lebanese mods, and this could become a little bit politically uh, costly for him. Um, Lamia, I mean, you know, we hear a pretty pessimistic uh, uh, assessment here of what can happen in the near term. Um, can you, I mean, I know you're, you're the optimistic person on the panel, so I turn to you and say, but run us through the consequences of no reforms uh, in the next six months, a year. I mean, you know, when I talk to my friends and family, they ask me, uh, where are we heading? Is it Venezuela? And I'm like, well, it's Lebanon. It could be Venezuela plus Somalia at the same time, for all I know, uh, because of the presidency. I mean, it's, it may be an extreme scenario, but I'm known as a, as a particularly pessimistic person. Uh, but, you know, how does the system uh, uh, adjust to uh, the the, uh, the shock that it's under right now, especially in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, imports of essential goods, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, services to the population, etc. Uh, because this, in turn, will have an impact on the relative strengths of uh, the political actors, right? I mean, you know, my, my former boss, uh, Corey Shaki, is asking, whether political actors uh, can be insulated from the general impoverishment that the, the country is going to uh, uh, go under. So, you know, what happens if, if you know, this worst case scenario uh, 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 takes place? Yes, in fact, um, uh, the fundamentals of Lebanon, even before the crisis, were much, uh, as everybody knows, were, were, uh, were much worse than Egypt, and much worse than uh, uh, Greece, much worse than etc. in terms of debt to GDP, in terms of uh, growth, in terms of uh, deficits, uh, and the, actually um, the behavior, the economic and financial behavior of the state did not help but perpetuate this cycle um, of, of let's, let me call it financial insanity. Um, but then again, um, this is a country that um, has also lots of strengths and the strengths that are within it are, in my view, not, did not totally dry yet. Um, of course, um, there is a, 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 this is the last moment. I, I mean, it's a long run and this is the kind of the last few miles um, this is a political system that has survived for so many years on feeding um, on the state, be it in uh, spending on electricity, mismanagement of funds, etc. If you just take a step back and look at it, it's a few, if you are running a course and you are at the last miles. So of course, and naturally, the uh, fight is going to be a very dire fight. And uh, this is this is in, in itself uh, a beautiful opportunity if you can understand it and see it within the historical context of the evolution of this country. Ma Let me back, go back to Macron. Macron is coming um, not only because there is a moment called the uh, economic crisis or there is a moment called the revolution or there is another moment called it this immense blast but because there is a historical moment. It's called the 100 years. And I think France need to mark that for the coming 100 years because of the special historical relationship, but also of the presence of France uh, in the region and in the, in the grand scheme of the influence in the region. And because it's also it's fighting its last fight on the Eastern Mediterranean. So um, the grand game, if you want, or the grand picture, um, you have to keep it in your mind when, when addressing um, the intricacy of, 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 uh, of Lebanon. But again, I think that um, we tend to focus a lot on the politics as the lever on the, and today a lot on the economic and, and financial. And we for, forget that this is a society that has a network of strengths all over the world and that did not dry out yet. 
Thank you. Uh, you said, uh, I'll get to you, Reem, but uh, you said 100 years. And when I hear 100 years, I'm like, if there's one issue that is less addressed than, than Lebanon's many crises, it's going to be climate change coming for us in 100 years. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, uh, we'll celebrate that. Uh, say, uh, sorry, that's, uh, that's me just proving I'm the most pessimistic guy around. Um, Reem, I actually, I said, thank you, Lamia, for making the point about actually the, the broader geostrategic significance of all that. It's not just emotional and I just want to turn to Reem and you know in your conversations uh, and there's a couple of questions about this and your conversation with officials um, you know to what extent is the the issue of Lebanon framed strategically in terms of French uh, assertiveness in the eastern Mediterranean uh, in terms of the you know the, the power games that are happening all around I mean you know we see a lot of noise these days not that much evidence, but still quite a lot of noise about Turkey, uh, you know, uh, investing in, 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 in Lebanon. Uh, we hear that the UAE, which was a very quiet player at one point, is interesting and play a bigger role. Uh, Saudi Arabia, which was a traditional uh, 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 powerhouse in, in Lebanon, uh, seems to be still, uh, you know, uh, uh, sitting it back, not knowing exactly, you know, having been bruised in Lebanon and having seen no return on its invest, strategic investments for, for, for all these years. So I'm just curious, to what extent is this, you know, the attention to Lebanon is part of this bigger uh, uh, power politics games in the, in the Eastern Med? So I think that's a super central question. I just wanted to say one thing in response to Corey's uh, question, which is about how insulated the Lebanese sort of political elite can be toward of the impoverishment of, this, of the society. You know, Lebanon is a patronage-based, clientelism-based society. In a way, this might sound really counterintuitive, the impoverishment of some parts of the society may give these political leaders even more of a stranglehold on the population as the population, some of them, uh, grows even more dependent on the patronage and the clientelism. So that's one thing we should also keep in mind. Now, turning to um, the regional dynamics, you're absolutely right. Um, as you know, and as our listeners know, currently France and Turkey are at truly loggerheads in the Eastern Mediterranean. The tensions are extremely high. There are actual naval ships in the Mediterranean being deployed on both sides in, in quite an aggressive posture. Uh, and Lebanon, of course, is part of that thinking. As you know, Turkey is having and has a growing influence among a certain part of the Lebanese population. Um, I'm not saying that, Leb that Turkey is involved the way Iran is involved uh, with, say, Hezbollah, but there is a, a sense of um, dispossessment among certain parts of the Lebanese population, in particular the Sunnis, uh, some of whom feel like they don't really have a, a political leadership that they can rely on and have over recent years started idolizing someone like uh, Turkish President Erdogan. Uh, so there is a bit of a, you know, fertile land there for more Turkish um, uh, influence. And that's not something France wants to see happen. And that's part of their thinking. Um, and of course, Lebanon is on the Mediterranean. It's, it's, a, it's a point. And you saw that, uh, you know, a French uh, naval ship was sent there very quickly, of course, to bring, uh, to bring um, uh, sort of materials for the humanitarian aid, but it's also part of a posture, you know. The, fr the French uh, defense minister went to Lebanon uh, a few days after uh, French President uh, Macron went there. Uh, so clearly they're marking their territory. And uh, as you know, uh, the French are quite close to the UAE positioning when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, but also Turkey. Uh, and and they're more or less, you know, there's some overlap there. I wouldn't say they're completely in, uh, you know, in sync, uh, but there's overlap there. And it's, it's true what you say about Saudi Arabia. I mean, it seems to be so far the most reluctant, even after this explosion, it remains very shy. We saw a UAE proposal of, uh, you know, rebuilding the port in exchange for, you, you know, sort of exploiting it or using it for 25 years, if I'm not mistaken. 
you haven't seen anything on that level from from Saudi Arabia, which you know ten years ago would have been exactly the opposite. Um, and and actually, don't underestimate uh, the issue and the complication that. Um, represents when it comes to reaching an agreement. Saudi Arabia may not be very uh, sort of engaged, but it does have a kind, not a veto per se, but it does have a card to play in terms of uh, objecting to a prime minister or another. Yeah, and it can, you know, it can tell the Lebanese, you do what you want, we will deny you the, the support that you expect. Um, it's not necessarily a veto right, but it's, a, you know, the right to do but nothing about about it, and um, say, so you know that's that's an interesting uh, uh, element uh, to uh, in in this equation. I mean, ultimately, you know, when when I look at this, the the, the international picture is conf very confused. I mean, as uh, Joe and and you have said, um, you know, U.S. Iran tensions will you know dictate a lot of what the U.S. will or will not do. Uh, regionally, there are real differences uh, between between various actors, and you know so much is is expected of the French, but the French themselves are not an arbiter of competition; they are a party to competition uh, so you know they 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 won't they don't necessarily have all the the space they want to get to this perfect solution that that, that you know uh, a number uh, uh, of, of people uh, expect. Uh, there is the extreme one, which is uh, uh, France come back, but uh, you know I, I suspect that this is uh, this is much more out of frustration and and despair uh, than it is actually like a, a, any kind of political movement that has any significance uh, uh, on on this. So you know again the. You know, in a way, Lebanon had its moment. I mean, it was it was it received more attention uh, in the previous decade uh, than uh, perhaps warranted. Uh, you know, there was a time where Jacques Chirac was president and W. Bush was president in the U.S. And you know, uh, you, you could put large conferences together, but none of the actors today seem emotionally invested the way they were before. Um, also, because they've been burned, Emil. Yeah, I mean exactly. And, and there's no return, and there's no return on investment, especially for those who had hope for reforms in the past. And this is why, like, you know, I think we, we would all agree on this. The, the real starting point uh, is to get it right in terms of the financial audit and negotiations with the IMF. I mean, you know, without this, you don't rebuild any kind of trust with, with international uh, uh, partners, and you can't basically finance the operations of the state, and you can't secure uh, imports. And when I think uh, it's only yesterday that uh, we got the new numbers about inflation, I think it was 100% last month. Um, you know, just uh, so we are, you know, officially in hyperinflation now, uh, if you look at the, the previous year. So, you know, in a way, it's stopping the slide, as Joe says, will have to start with a hard nosed. Uh, uh, um, uh, negotiations with the IMF. There's nothing, nothing around it. Um, you know, there's a, 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 you know, on on this issue, I want to ask: Is that the central bank in Lebanon has been the 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 target of intense criticism? Uh, you know, ten years ago, our central bank governor uh, had more academy uh, uh, had more awards behind uh, him on his desk than. I don't know, Tom Hanks, did he win two or three Academy Awards or some other, you know, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, sorry, I say. So anyway, he was collecting it. He was celebrated as, uh, as uh, you know, the best central bank governor in the world. And today we realize that we're all locked out of our bank accounts. Uh, I don't know for, uh, for the rest of you, but uh, that's the case for uh, probably three million Lebanese. Um, how difficult, I mean, you know, it, it, the central bank in a way has financed the operation of an incompetent, corrupt state. Um, does it deserve the blame that is thrown at it these days? Um, is it, you know, do we buy the argument that they just funded the state and the state itself uh, is responsible for the corruption? Or is there, is there something else? Is that, you know, it, was it the, the entity that essentially made it possible for first Lebanon to grow the way it did after the war, which was quite significant, but second, uh, created this massive economic uh, 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 distortions? Uh, Joe, I'm curious about your take first, and if Lamia, you want to jump in. Uh, look, this is uh, this is a question that is uh, quite uh, popular in Lebanon. I mean, uh, I belong to the maybe minority that that uh, never really was uh, fascinated, at least for the last ten years, by by the governor's performance. Uh, 
uh, I, I think that we were quite a few uh, expecting that, that this Ponzi scheme was going to collapse and, and the, the, even the term Ponzi scheme was used, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, something like five years ago. So it's, it's not new. Now, um, of course, I won't enter in the rationales that led the, 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 the various economic decision makers to do what they did. Uh, but I think that today, uh, w when you have even uh, the president of France saying that one of the uh, uh, core issues about uh, launching reforms and, and cleaning up, let's say, the files, is to audit not only the central bank, but also the banking sector. And this is something that one day we will uh, be forced to talk about. I mean, uh, you know, in a country where the, the banking sector or banking as such constitutes more than half of the economy in which uh, banking is a culture and I mean without getting back to the Shiha writings and etc but where part of the raison d'etre of the country is the banking sector and its financial sector uh, to see banks and bankers today contemporary bankers failing uh, their mission their ethical mission and their professional mission and their clients and their public is something I think that is very symbolic of the of the collapse of this country. I mean, it's as if uh, I don't know uh, Switzerland didn't know how to make watches again or chocolate. You see, I mean, this is exactly the same the same image. I mean, so uh, this alone should trigger um, a, a real structural thinking in Lebanon about who we are. What do we want to be in the 21st century and what do we want to produce in the first 21st century? We cannot continue to, to create a country around some very simplistic and uh, uh, pseudo-romantic ideas about the fact that the Lebanese are brilliant and they go abroad and send money home and except this does not create an economy so even if we should uh, start to plant olives or I don't know what but we should start thinking about how to create a sustainable real economy uh, that will help us enter uh, in the 21st century if uh, there's a, there is uh, a second centennial that is written for this country to stay alive. Uh, I'm sorry to be so gloomy, but I think that some people who belong to the elite in this country, be it the economic, the political, or even the cultural elite in this country, should really reckon now about certain things upon which they made a whole country and sometimes the world live. Some illusions, some lies, some fantasies, and sometimes some wishful thinking. I, I, I know that I'm a bit harsh here, but I think that the, the, the direness of the situation that we have reached lately should trigger this kind of, uh, of critical thinking about ourselves first. Thank you. Lamia? Uh, yes, I, I definitely agree. And um, uh, let us always be reminded that the governance deficiencies in Lebanon need to be understood as political in origin as much as technical. So the technical deficiencies in institutions, including BDL, certainly, I mean, are entrenched, but they are rooted in the underlying political conditions and the structure that prevent the simple uh, fixes and uh, uh, under, under a complex power sharing arrangement uh, that help seal the peace between the Lebanese war warlord. The system has, of course, engendered corruption, systematic uh, failure, cultural impunity, uh, and of course, uh, in the absence of institutional and societal accountability. The main problem in the equation is that the political class, the central bank, and the banking sector uh, are a close circle, and each party profiteering from the other, which also means that the reform of one of those will force the reform of the other, something that also requires political will in the current context of Lebanon. The banking sector is highly controlled by political elites. In fact, if you look at the shareholders, the founders, the partners in the Lebanese banks, you'll see that they are all, all connected, either connected uh, or they are themselves political figures who have gatekeepers in the central bank and who have also gatekeepers inside the administration. So this closed system, of course, allowed the ruling class and BDL to uh, safeguard the interest uh, to their own interest in the face of any reform at attempt. Again, 
We speak of informal networks that are penetrating the banking sector in Lebanon, penetrating BDL, a collusion between private and public interests. Breaking the loop will not be easy, but and it will require one party of the three to grant concessions and accept the fact that reforms are no, no longer an option, no longer an option, nor more a necessity for this country to stand on its feet, uh, the other two will have to follow. What is again needed in this scenario is a very strong uh, support uh, from the international community, of course, but also support from uh, uh, the Lebanese themselves. I mean, in bringing, including alliances, very strong alliances with the judicial counter uh, establishment with the syndicates, with civil society, think tanks, groups, political, uh, new political figures uh, from the Saura in favor of the reform dynamics. And this is where the fight is. This is the big fight. This is the last big fight. Thank you. Thank you, Lamia. Uh, we're over time. We have a couple more questions. I'm not going to take them directly or I'm just going to, uh, you know, allude to them. Uh, and one of them is from my boss who asked it at 2.29 uh, uh, p.m. London time. And he's the, the person who always tells me, Emil, end your meetings on time. So I'm going to have to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, I mean, first, Jeremy Bowen of the BBC asked about whether how much Hezbollah knew about the nitrate at the port and whether, you know, uh, you know, this could impact its position in Lebanon. We, we discussed this earlier. I mean, the sense in general, if I, if I may, uh, is that it knew, but it wasn't the key actor in the mismanagement of, of this cash. Of course, there have been revelations since then, or there have been allegations about uh, imports and things like that. But in, we still have to be careful about n not making this, this explosion first and foremost about, about Hezbollah, just because it's convenient for a number of people and so on. And this is why the, the an investigation is so important. We all have, I think, our doubts about, you know, whether the investigation will tell the truth. Uh, but that's going to be a, a big one. Uh, my boss, uh, John Chipman, asks about uh, whether a contact group uh, uh, um, framework, uh, like the one that, uh, uh, you know, oversaw the, the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, would do it. Um, and you know to to draw in the key countries and so on i mean there are informal groups including the international support group for lebanon and so on but uh, not, nothing has been uh, uh, you know is, is is formalized and the then and the big question remains on this whether to include iran or not uh, and given us iran tensions and also but there's a, a real question uh, turkey as well uh, is another uh, uh, question mark so if you create a contact group but you keep two powerful actors outside it you actually create a reason for escalation at the same time it's unclear for instance in the case of iran what it could actually provide real iran is not known for providing uh, financial support uh, for you know helping to stabilize other countries so uh, the Gulf states in particular are not very interested in, in this. So, w w you know, the idea has been floated, but it was never formalized because it's, it's, too, uh, it's too difficult. Um, anyway, uh, I think I'll end it here. We are five minutes uh, beyond schedule. Uh, but uh, uh, Lamia, uh, thank you very much for your time. Joe, thank you very much for your time and, and good luck settling in Beirut. Uh, I'll come to see you soon. Uh, Lamia, you too. And Rim, thank you very much. And uh, uh, you, if, if President Macron goes to uh, Beirut, I suspect you will be on this trip. So please read her reporting uh, and uh, you know, to give, us, uh, give us good news. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for attending. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, have a good week. Bye-bye.